And so we use the uh, small nuclear RNA genes as a model system for transcription and RNA processing. And these encode, for example, the spliceosomal U1 and U2 SNRNA genes, uh, SNRNAs. And we, we're particularly fond of these genes as a model system because they're very short and they're very simple. And all the elements that you require for expression are within half a kilobase. And this makes them easy to manipulate and to uh, make mutations. And some of them, for example, the U2 gene, are also highly repeated. So this is repeated uh, about 15 times on uh, chromosome 17 in a 6.1 kilobase tandem repeat. And this facilitates, for example, chromatin immunoprecipitation chip and also expression studies. And uh, one of the other reasons that we, we like these genes is that they're different in several respects from the protein coding genes that are also transcribed by Paul 2 For example, the promoters are very simple with only two elements, an essential proximal sequence element and a distal sequence element with some, pro some properties of an enhancer. There are no introns in the... Uh, in the transcript, and 3' end formation is directed by a 3' box that's specific to these genes rather than the poly A site found in protein coding genes. And we um, suppose that any fundamental uh, properties of the polymerase and transcription and RNA processing should be shared between the two types of genes, whereas differences in how they're transcribed or processed give you opportunities for uh, gene type specific regulation. And you might think that because they're short and simple, these genes are default and that any uh, extras for the protein coding genes are added on, but this doesn't seem to be entirely the case. So uh, in the 1980s, the Weiner and Dahlberg labs showed that the three prime box here is only recognized if transcription is initiated from this type of promoter, from an SNRNA type promoter, indicating that there's a strong link between these. And this was taken at the time to indicate that the three prime box was a transcription terminator that worked in tandem with the promoter. However, Patricia Ugwin in my lab was able to show that the three prime box is in fact uh, an RNA processing element analogous to the poly A site. And, and in fact, the findings in the 1980s were, uh, were an indication, a very extreme example of what we now know to be the link, the very strong coupling between transcription and RNA processing. And uh, we've been uh, interested to answer a couple of questions regarding uh, these findings. For example, how is RNA 3' end formation in these genes linked to transcription? And why is this promoter specific? And it turns out that the RNA polymerase itself has a large role to play in this linkage. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, the, uh, the um, large subunit of RNA polymerase 2 has a carboxy terminal domain with a very unusual structure. It's comprised in humans of tandem repeats, uh, 52 in, uh, repeats in human, 25 repeats in, in yeast of the uh, amino acid heptad YSPTSPS. And this is not found in Paul 2. Uh, Paul 1 or Paul 3, so it's specific to Paul 2. And this carboxy terminal domain is located in the 3D structure of the polymerase, very close to where the RNA exits while it's been synthesized. So it's, it's um, very nicely positioned to influence what's happening to the RNA while it's being transcribed. 
And we have looked at the role of the CTD in this linkage between the promoter and the three prime box using a very nice uh, CTD complementation system set up by Jeffrey Corden, where the large subunit has been made resistant, resistant to the fungal toxin alpha manatin, which usually inhibits transcription by Paul II at relatively low levels. And uh, you can transfect in the large subunit into your, uh, into your cells. And if you hit the cells with alpha manatin, it causes um, turnover of the endogenous large subunit. So it causes the transcription to stop and the large subunit to be turned over. So then any transcription you score after this has to be dependent on the large subunit that you've introduced. This is a very nice system and you can make any mutations you like in the large subunit and have a look at the consequences. And we've used um, a reporter gene system to follow three prime processing where we've replaced the, um, the U2 RNA encoding region of the U2 gene with a piece of globin uh, DNA. And after transfection and RNA's protection, you can see proper three prime end formation. So this is the, the RNA's protection <laughs> probe where you, haven't, you don't have any processing. And when you have processing, you see the uh, shorter band here. You can see a small amount of read through. So this is with the endogenous polymerase. You shut this off using alpha manatin. And you can see that the wild type or the full length CTD containing uh, a large subunit construct fully complements the production, three prime end processing and transcription. And 25 repeats is pretty much enough to give you a, a reasonable level of processing. However, if you truncate the CTD so that you leave only five repeats left, you lose all your processing. And this indicates that the CTD of the PAL2 is involved in this coupling of transcription and uh, three prime box recognition. And this is exactly what was shown for protein coding genes by David Bentley's lab in 1997. So in both cases, you have this coupling. And the PAL2 CTD a heptapeptide, interestingly, all of the amino acids in this can be modified in some way. So, for example, uh, most the serines, the threonines, and the, the tyrosine can all be phosphorylated. And the prolines can be uh, trans or cis through isomerization. So you can, you, can, uh, you can modify all of these. And the fact that you can reversibly modify all of these uh, amino acids during transcription led to the hypothesis by uh, Stephen Burotovsky that this can give you a code that can um, help influence downstream events during the transcription process by helping to recruit or repel transcription and RNA processing uh, uh, factors during the transcription process. And most, up to this point, is really known about the functions and the uh, modification of the serines, particularly serine 2 and serine 5. So serine 5 is known to be phosphorylated early in the transcription cycle by the general transcription factor TF2H, the CDK7 uh, kinase um, subunit of TF2H phosphorylates serine 5. And later in transcription, serine 2 is phosphorylated by the CDK9 kinase subunit of the positive transcription elongation factor B. And this is um, associated with elongation competence and activation of splicing and polyadenylation. And if you look in yeast using antibodies uh, against these specific modifications of serine 2 and serine 5, you see this characteristic pattern of uh, high serine 5 phosphorylation levels early in transcription and higher and high serine 2 phosphorylation levels 
at the end, towards the end of the transcript. And this is produced by the combination of kinases and phosphatases. And this is known to facilitate the uh, um, sequential recruitment of factors to the CTD during the transcription cycle. For example, capping enzyme is recruited by serine 5 phosphorylation just after initiation, whereas elongation factors are recruited during transcription and termination factors and RNA processing factors, polyadenylation factors towards the three prime end of the gene. So this has all been worked out in protein coding genes. And the code is getting ever more complicated as more marks have been discovered. So we're up to quite a, a serious um, number of combinations for all the um, phosphorylation and proline isomeration marks that have so far been described. Now we wanted to uh, understand what role the different serines in the CTD were playing in, in transcription and RNA processing of the snRNA genes. And we've taken a very surgical approach to this in that we've mutated in turn all of the serines to the non-phospho acceptor alanine. And we've built up these constructs one repeat at a time. And while we were making all these mutations of serine 2, 5, and 7, we uh, discovered that at the same time Rob Chapman in Dirk Ike's lab had already gone further and he'd made constructs with 48 repeats with all different mutations in them, whereas we'd only got up to 25. And luckily for us, they were very friendly and they gave us all their constructs. So we didn't have to go any further. And to keep a very long story short, Sylvan Egloff, who's, who's a postdoc in the lab, he took all the constructs that were made by me and um, Alice Taylor, the uh, research assistant in the lab, and he transfected into cells, used the same complementation system that I've described already. And what he found was just as had been found for protein coding genes, mutation of serine 2 or 5 uh, affected expression of snRNA genes. Certainly for serine 5, probably the effect was on capping and presumably through phosphorylation of the CTD. However, what uh, serine found, uh, what Sylvan found when he mutated serine 7 was quite surprising. So using the same, uh, the same complementation system as before, what Sylvan found is with consensus repeats, he had very good 3' end formation uh, of these uh, reporter constructs. But when you mutated serine 7, you lost not only transcription, but also 3' end formation. So um, the level of stable RNA was very reduced, and the processing, the recognition of the 3' box was affected. However, when you do the same experiments using a reporter protein coding gene construct with a poly A site and the CMV promoter, you'd have little effect, if any, on uh, the level of RNA produced. And uh, recognition of the poly A site, if anything, is better when you mutate serine 7. So this seems to be a selective effect of serine 7A mutation on snRNA gene expression. And at the time when Sylvan was doing these experiments, uh, Shehekatar's lab published the characterization of uh, a, fa a large complex known, integrator, known as integrator. It's a very big one <coughs> megadalton 12 subunit complex. And they showed that this associates with the CTD of Pol2 and is required for recognition of the 3' box. Now, we had been looking for this complex, but they got there first. And this complex contains two subunits, int 9 and int 11, that are homologues of the poly A factors, 
CPSF 100 and CPSF 73. And this is the endonuclease in both cases in 11 and CPS 73. So we asked ourselves whether the CTD uh, and the serine 7 mutation were, were affecting um, the recruitment of integrator to snRNA genes. And Sylvan uh, used a GST pull-down system to look at this. So he um, phosphorylated uh, GST CTD constructs either with wild type or um, serine mutations. He phosphorylated this by incubation with nuclear extract, cleared out the proteins, carried out uh, GST, pulled down with fractions uh, with the semi-purified integrator, and then um, analyzed for INT11 by Western to see whether uh, we were actually pulling down integrator. And the consensus repeats after phosphorylation um, are able to uh, be recognized by INT11 and presumably other parts of the integrator complex. If you mutate serine 7 to alanine, you lose this uh, interaction. So this was a, a, a good molecular explanation for the loss of 3' end formation when you mutate serine 7 to alanine. However, mutation of serine 2A also leads to loss of pull down of the integrator complex. And um, Sylvan used a lot of different synthetic uh, peptides with, with phosphates on different uh, serines. What he was able to show is that you need two CTD repeats for uh, INT11 to bind, and um, that really you can get detectable binding only with two phosphates, phosphate on the serine 7 of the first repeat and phosphate on the serine 2 of the second repeat. And they're defining a new double phosphomark on the CTD that recruits the integrator complex, or at the very least, the catalytic subunits in 9 and in 11. And this, uh, the fact that serine 2 was involved in the um, association of integrator, and particularly phosphorylation of serine 2, was very satisfying to us because um, a student in the lab, uh, Joanne Medlin, had previously shown that CDK9 inhibitors, so these inhibit uh, positive uh, transcription elong elongation factor B, like DRB and this one that we call KM, not only effectively inhibit phosphorylation of serine 2 of the CTD, you see this here, so you, you inhibit the phosphorylation of serine 2, but not serine 5, and this, these drugs effectively inhibit 3' end formation of this snRNA gene construct. So it inhibits recognition of the 3' box. So this ties it together that you need serine 2 phosphorylation, serine 7 phosphorylation for recruitment of integrator to give you um, efficient 3' end formation. However, one thing that Joe noticed that, that was quite, uh, we find quite surprising is that although these drugs that inhibit CDK9 and PTFB, although they have a major effect on RNA processing, they have little detectable effect on transcription of these genes. Now, you might think that's because they're very short, but the transcription unit is minimum 1 kb. And in protein coding genes, these inhibitors would stop transcription at a much earlier point. And this is the, the result of run-on using several inhibitors of uh, PTFB, and we see very little effect on transcription. So this is an effect only on RNA processing uh, with these inhibitors. In protein golden genes instead, the uh, PTFB complex activates elongation of uh, the polymerase, elongation of transcription, 
as well as activating splicing and polyadenylation. So there seems to be a disconnect here in the, in the only one of the activities that are affected in transcription of snRNA genes. And just to remind you that uh, in, in protein coding genes, there's thought to be a general early elongation checkpoint that's set up by binding to the polymerase after initiation of transcription by the negative elongation factors DSIF and NELF. And the polymerase can't proceed uh, past this early elongation checkpoint until PTFB phosphorylates NELF, which then leave, leaves, this inhibitor then leaves the, the transcription complex. It phosphorylates DSIF to turn that into a positive elongation factor. And it phosphorylates serine 2 of the CTD. And only then can transcription proceed. So this doesn't appear to be happening in the SNRNA genes, and we, we sought to understand why. And the first thing that Sylvan and Don O'Reilly, a postdoc in the lab, uh, looked at was the um, chromatin structure of these genes to see whether this gave us any clue. And we've used the beta-actin gene as a control since Joe found in her studies that this transcription is blocked by uh, CDK9 inhibitors in this case. And what we found was that the whole of the transcription unit of the U2 genes is nucleosome depleted. So for as far as transcription goes, there seems to be a valley of um, nucleosomes, whereas there's a nucleosome free, free region in the beta-actin gene, but just at the start of transcription. Not, it doesn't extend the whole length of the transcription unit. And in fact, in the, the nucleosome free region in protein coding genes is generally a bit shorter than this. In the beta-actin gene, it's actually quite long, and I'll come back to that. And if you hit the cells with uh, the CDK9 inhibitor, DRB, you do, in fact, have little effect on the POL2 loading, as measured by CHIP here. You have little effect on the POL2 loading on the SNRNA genes, whereas in the beta-actin gene, after the point where the nucleosomes uh, have risen in concentration, you lose transcription. And this is what you see in most protein coding genes, that, that the end of the transcription unit, you don't have any transcripts at all. And interestingly, NELF, the negative elongation factor that's involved in this early elongation checkpoint, is found on the SNRNA genes, but it's found at the very end of the transcription unit. Okay. In the beta-actin gene, again, NELF is at its highest concentration just before the nucleosome concentration rises. So in this case, it looks like NELF is not setting up an elongation checkpoint, but rather termination of transcription. So the checkpoint in these genes appears to be closed. And if you knock down NELF, so Sylvan's knocked down NELF using RNAi, Using nuclear run-on, you can see that the polymerase now can go a bit further. And you see the same if you do pol 2 chip. The polymerase can go a little bit further downstream. Again, supporting this idea that NELF is working as a termination factor in these genes rather than an early elongation factor. And interestingly, Sylvan uh, also saw CTCF binding just upstream of the position where you see NELF on the U2G. And if you knock down CTCF using RNAi, <coughs> you also see a transcription termination defect as measured by nuclear run-on or POL2 chip. And clearly, a Lytem, a postdoc in the lab, was able to show that knocking down CTCF 
causes loss of NELF from the template. So we think that CTCF is a part of this extreme checkpoint or terminator, and we also think it's part of the early elongation checkpoint on the beta actin gene. So to summarize this part, it looks like your PTFB activity is only needed if your template is nucleosome. So you only need to have that extra boost if your template is wrapped. If it's, if it's open, then the polymerase can access it and go through it without much trouble. But there must be some difference between the beta actin and the U2 genes that leads to a different outcome when you hit this CTCF NELF checkpoint. Okay? So we surmise that maybe this is due to differential recruitment or activity of some elongation factors that would help you get through the nucleosomes. And to keep, to, to keep another long story short, Hadil al-Rawaf and Justina Zaborowska, two um, PhD students in the lab, carried out um, an extensive chip analysis to look for the association of elongation factors and histone modifications, either with the beta-actin or the U2 genes. And I think what's obvious here is that several factors found on protein coding genes, several histone modifications, like H2B ubiquitination, H3K36 trimethylation, and SET1 that's uh, responsible for H3K4 trimethylation are missing. And several what are thought to be key elongation factors like PATH1, SPT6, TSF1, FACT, are missing as well. So you have a limited, sorry, FACT is there. Uh, you have a limited set of elongation factors and histone modif modifications on the snRNA genes, some of which are probably responsible for this behavior of the polymerase when it hits the early elongation checkpoint in protein coding genes versus snRNA genes, and in particular, PATH1. We also find that phospho-DSIF, which is known to recruit PATH, is at a much lower level on the snRNA genes. So we can, we can tentatively conclude that it's differential recruitment of some of these key elongation factors and histone modification enzymes that gives you this differential behavior when you, me you meet this uh, NELF and CTCF dependent terminator. It means that you cannot make the transition into a productive elongation through a nucleosomal template. And does CTD phosphorylation play any role in this? Jury's out, but I'll, I'll just tell you what we've seen. So the CTD phosphorylation profiles during transcription are not the same on the snRNA and the protein coding genes. So first of all, all the modifications occur in a very, very short space. So they're kind of scrunched up into the, the short gene. So you have serine 5 and serine 7 come up early in transcription and serine 2 comes up towards the end of transcription, which is what you see on protein coding genes, but it occurs in a very, very short space. On the beta-actin gene, all of these modifications are, are spread out, and serine 7 phosphorylation is highest at the 3' prime end of the beta-actin gene. So there's a, there's a difference in the profiles. Also, phosphorylation of the CTD is higher for all the marks on the beta-actin gene. So you've got lower levels of phosphorylation on the snRNA genes, which may be simply because you load a lot of polymerase. So it might just be that you can't phosphorylate too much of it. And the, 
the early peak of both serine 5 and serine 7 phosphorylation on the U2 genes can be explained by the fact that uh, the CDK7 sub subunit of TF2H phosphorylates both 5 and 7. So you're phosphorylating both of these early in transcription. And uh, perhaps this, dro this, this drop in both serine, well, in serine 5 phosphorylation here is due to the early recruitment of a serine 5 phosphatase. And Sylvan has uh, studied the serine 5 phosphatase RPAP2, which is a homologue of the yeast RTR1, since there were some indications that this interacts with integrator. So we thought perhaps integrator was recruiting this phosphatase to the gene early. Turns out that's not the case. And in fact, RPAP2 recruits integrator. And what Sylvan was able to show is that phosphorylation of serine 7 actually recruits this phosphatase to the snRNA genes. And this phosphatase in turn dephosphorylates serine 5, which gives you this drop in the serine 5 level. It recruits a subcomplex of integrator that's missing the catalytic subunits. And if you knock down RPP2, I'll show you what happens. Your serine 5, phosphoserine 5 level on the U2 genes increases dramatically, and you lose integrator recruitment, and you lose 3' end formation. And you can see this loss of uh, RPP2 causes a global increase in serine 5 phosphorylation, and in fact, it's the serine 5 phosphatase also for protein coding genes. But in this case, it's not recruited by serine 7 phosphorylation. So this is a gene-specific SNRNA, gene-specific gene recruitment of this phosphatase through serine 7 phosphorylation. And just to show you that it is a phosphatase, if you in vitro phosphorylate the CTD on 5, 2, and 7, and add increasing amounts of RPP2, you lose serine 5 phosphorylation, but not 2 and 7. And Sylvan has further mapped this to be within the very uh, short domain of unknown function that it shares with the yeast, RTR1. So the CTD code for protein coding genes and snRNA genes, it seems to be working slightly differently. And it's becoming very complex, this whole uh, recruitment process. And we now have many proteins that are known to be recruited to protein coding genes through serine 2 and serine 5 phosphorylation. In snRNA genes, mammalian snRNA genes, you also have serine 7 phosphorylation involvement in the transition from initiation right through to RNA processing. And the yeast snRNA store genes are also slightly different. But so far, there's no good uh, function for serine 7 phosphorylation in these <coughs> genes. So, so far, serine 7 phosphorylation seems to have a specific uh, function in expression of these genes. Now, what do we think drives all these differences between expression of protein coding genes and snRNA genes? Well, of course, the best candidate is the promoter. And we know something about the factors that are uh, recruited to the promoter. For example, the distal sequence element is recognized by OCT1 that's also used by protein coding genes. And most of the general factors are shared between these two gene types. So A, B, E, F, and H, and TBP 
are all shared between the two classes. However, PTF, which binds the PSE, is specific for this type of gene. So that's likely to be involved in any specific downstream events. And TF2D, which is TBP complex with TBP associated factors or TAFs, cannot drive transcription of these genes in vitro. So these, so these two might be considered gene type specific factors. But we didn't know which of any TAFs were associated with the snRNA genes. So Justina Zaborowska, uh, a student in the lab, has carried out chip analysis of the beta actin gene and the U2 gene using uh, antibodies for all the known TAFs. And she's found 1 to 13 associated with the beta actin gene, but only a subcomplex with much fewer TAFs associated with the U2 gene. And this we've named the small nuclear TAF complex, SN-TAF-C. And just to put all of this information together in a cartoon, what we imagine is happening is that the promoter is somehow driving these downstream events through association of PTF and this small uh, TBP TAF subcomplex. After initiation, CDK7 phosphorylate serine 7 and serine 5 of the CTD, which allows association of capping enzymes and capping of the 5' prime end of the transcript. RPP2 is recruited by serine 7 phosphorylation and it brings in some of the subunits of the integrator complex and causes the dephosphorylation of serine 5. PTFB comes in to phosphorylate serine 2 and this then allows association of the catalytic subunits of the integrator, int 9 and int 11, to give you downloading of the integrator to the 3' box to allow processing to occur. And the polymerase is terminated by the CTCF NELF checkpoint after RNA processing due to the lack of elongation factors that would allow this complex to proceed through the nucleosomes. So we've, we've kind of answered a bit our question, how is RNA 3' end formation linked to transcription? So it's through the CTD, through integrator, and through RPP2. We still don't understand why this is promoter specific because RPP2 also associates with protein coding genes. But we think there must be some specific interactions between some of these factors with the factors at the promoter. And this is what we're trying to understand. So we still have lots of questions. So I still haven't found what I'm looking for. So this is, this is now not about transcription, but probably more what people here are interested in. So I'd just like to tell you quickly about a new class of snRNA genes that we've been working on. And this has been done by Don O'Reilly, who's postdoc in the lab. And what Don found was, although there are a few true U1 genes on chromosome 1, there are also many what were thought to be pseudogenes on the other arm. So she's annotated minimum 21 of these what are known as class 1 pseudogenes. And they were thought to be pseudogenes because the RNA that they would encode differed from U1. However, they have all the promoter and 3' processing elements that you would expect 
of a true gene. And if you look in RNA-seq data from HeLa cells, you can find some of these RNAs from these pseudogenes that we have now termed variant or VU1 snRNA genes because they make a product. And although it doesn't seem like there's very much of it, here 0.16% of the true U1, if you do pull down to look for complexes, this most highly expressed variant U1, U1.8, is at about the same level as U11. So it could easily be functional. And these RNAs are three prime processed properly, and they're complex with protein in RNPs. And we're just in the process of um, analyzing which proteins are associated with these RNAs. They're also differentially expressed. So you can see for this one, the VU1.8, it's high in um, stem cells and in macrophages, and it's very low in skin fibroblasts. And you find these variant U1 snRNA genes in uh, placental mammals and in primates. And in primates, there are uh, many more. And the primate U VU1 snRNAs are distinct, so they have a different sequence from those in low lower mammals. But, and you can see that they're placental mammals and upwards, mainly in primates. And between human, chimp, and orangutan, these are fairly well conserved. But the proof of the pudding is in the knockdown. And if you knock down VU1.8, like here, you affect expression of about 10% of genes. And since the major function of U1 is in, is in splicing, you might expect knocking down a variant U1 might cause splicing defects. And you do see some splicing defects. You see gene expression in some cases going up or down. But the bulk of the effects are in transcription and or polyadenylation. And here we've validated some of the effects on splicing. So these are uh, some of the genes that came up in the microarray. Dawn has looked at, and in fact, she does see um, either skipping or um, inclusion in some cases. And in all the genes she's tested that come on the, up on the microarray, you can see some splicing defects. But U1 snRNA was recently shown to have another function to suppress internal polyadenylation. So it seems to stop poly A uh, cleavage and polyadenylation happening throughout the transcript so that it happens only at the final poly A site. When you knock down U1, you have activation of these internal poly A sites, which results in truncation of the transcript and premature termination that's caused. This is uh, wild type U1 or one of the It's wild type. This is wild type. This is the Dreyfus yeah, yeah. story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And this is known as premature cleavage and termination, clema, pre, premature cleavage and polydenylation, PCPA. And Don sees the same in a large number of uh, genes in human, that she loses the three prime end of the transcript. So the three prime end of the transcript is lost and she gets PCPA at cryptic poly A sites further upstream, closer to the, the start site in the transcript. So these are two examples where she sees it, the PRPF4B and the VAPA gene. And if uh, she does three prime race, she can see this move to um, premature cleavage and polyadenylation 
at poly A sites that are much closer to the start site. And you can see it here as well. And they don't seem to be uh, targets, or at least not as, as uh, clear targets, of U1 knockdown. So there seems to be um, some kind of uh, separation between the effects of uh, knocking down U1 and knocking down these variants on PCPA in <coughs> different genes. So you can see here that knockdown of U1 causes PCPA in this gene, but knockdown of VU1.8 doesn't. So I think that we can, we can say, although we don't have a molecular mechanism for how they're working yet, we think that these VU1 SNRA genes have been misclassified as pseudogenes. And that these SNRNAs participate in polyacite regulation and splicing. They're differentially expressed, so they may be involved in differentiation or developments. And they may be key players regulating um, ESL uh, pluripotency because they're highest in ES cells. So deregulation could potentially lead to pathological dysfunction. And Don is now looking to see if these, any of these variants are um, aberrantly expressed in, um, in disease, in, in several types of disease. And just to uh, acknowledge the people who've done the work, Sylvain uh, was a postdoc with me. He's now in France. Hadil uh, is a student just finished. Don has done all the work on the, the variants. Alice, who helped me with the CTD work, has just left, unfortunately. Cleo was working on CTCF and the GrowSeq. Justina did all the TAF work. Martin's our bioinformatician. And I, I didn't talk about Olga and Pilar's work. And I'd like to thank the MRC, Wellcome Trust, EPA Trust, and the Oxford Stem Cell Institute for funding. And some of this work was done in collaboration with David Bentley, uh, some with Rob Chapman and Dirk Ike. And we're collaborating with Yuki Yamaguchi and Hiroshi Handa with, on the NELF project. And Bob gave us all the antibodies for the TAFs. And Sally Cowley and William James are helping us with the stem cell work. And just to put some pictures to the names. When Sylvan was in the lab, there were only other girls. <laughs> and he's now gone. And Martin has taken over the role as the sole male surrounded by women. <laughs>